All right, welcome to Liquid Lunch. It's me, Hugh, and Jen is here today, as she was yesterday. Hello, author, everyone. Author of Undead Redhead. And we got a great show today. In fact, our first guest is also an author. So you've got that in common with her already, Jen. Well, and, and my character go through a lot of trauma. I think that my character would probably have been um, very happy to have Lisa helping her out. Yes, oh, we yeah. have Lisa Ferentz joining us uh, via Skype from Baltimore. Here's the book, Finding Your Ruby Slippers, Transformative Life Lessons from the Therapist's Couch. And uh, you're not actually on a couch now, right? Lisa? Not at this moment. My clients are, but they don't lie down. They sit up. Well, Jen's <laughs> on a couch, so... Yeah, but I'm, oh, good. I'm, yeah, I'm <laughs> d- definitely doing the sitting up thing. <laughs> yeah, but we have a lot of couches here at that channel, so uh, we can accommodate uh, any number of uh, people. Yeah, Mo- it's good. If the broadcasting thing doesn't work out, um, <laughs> maybe you can bring in a couple of trauma therapists and we can actually do some good work. I mean, no, not that we're not doing good work anyway, right? Well, we we're have, enough, we have enough patients uh, right now, Lisa. Almost everybody here at that channel could use a little... I'm happy to give some free advice. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so this this book is, uh, maybe you could just give us, a, I mean, I read the title, um, but uh, maybe give us a little bit of an introduction to the book, who it's for, why you wrote it, and then we'll get into it from there. Sure, sure. So the truth is the book is for everyone and anyone. I wrote it for, as much for men as I did for women. And it's really a book about empowerment. So the title, Finding Your Ruby Slippers, is really about, it's taken from The Wizard of Oz. And you know how Dorothy spends the entire movie trying to find her way home. And she believes that the wizard has the answer to that, just as the everybody else, the cowardly lion, the scarecrow, they all believe that the wizard is the one who kind of holds the key to making them whole. And then, of course, what they discover at the end of the movie is that he's just a little guy behind a curtain with no <laughs> magical powers at all. But then there's this beautiful metaphoric moment when Glinda comes down and she says to Dorothy, you know, look at your own feet. You've been wearing the ruby slippers all along. And I love the idea of that because it's really saying to people, you have this incredible inner wisdom. And it's about knowing how to access it, trusting that it's there, believing that it's a good compass for you in your life, as opposed to believing that other people in your world are holding your ruby slippers and sort of turning your power over to them. Right. So that's the theme of it, yeah. And in that case, it also means that you you have the power to help heal yourself and you yes. have the you have some of the you have the knowledge i guess do you you have you have the ability to save yourself already Yes, I absolutely believe that. I also, though, believe that nobody should have to take that journey alone. And so whether it's people coming to me for therapy or it's people reading the books that I've written, it's about me providing them um, with kind of the the right questions to think about. There's a lot of journaling prompts throughout the book, and that's intentional. It's so that people can really turn inward and start to think on a deeper level about what they feel, how they think, what they want for themselves. So I think we all deserve to have guidance in taking that journey. But from day one, the message that I give to my clients, no matter how traumatized they've been, is that they do have this extraordinary inner wisdom and resiliency and creativity. And it's just a matter of learning how to reconnect with it. I always say to my clients, it's not about reinventing who you are. It's about reclaiming who you are. I think that's really wise. Um, The uh, can you tell us a little bit about your own background and how you came to uh, how you came to write the book, but also uh, why you felt you you had the experience to write the book? Yeah. Well, I've been in private practice for 33 years, so I've had the great privilege of learning from countless clients in my life. I always, whenever I approach a new therapeutic relationship, I always feel like I'm the student and often they are the teachers. And so I've approached my work with a very open-minded, open-hearted perspective. And because of that, I've learned a tremendous amount from really brave people who've been profoundly traumatized in, in every way that you could think of. And so I really stay open and listen to them, learn from them. I'm actually in the minority because I'm one of the few trauma specialists who is not a trauma survivor. So I had the great fortune of growing up in a family that was incredibly safe and loving. And I, from that and because of that, was able to have a really 
good, positive, solid sense of self-worth and self-esteem. So I've always felt, Jen, my whole life that my sort of obligation and responsibility is to pay that blessing forward and to help others to feel what I've been fortunate enough to feel, which is this fundamental sense of, of worthiness. And so I want to be able to pass that on to other people in, in my life. There's actually a chapter in your book about um, about comparing your trauma to others and yeah. and how that's not that could, that actually invalidates what you feel. Um, exactly. And I and I definitely know that in my in my own life that that one thing that tends to happen when you talk about your pain is that people say like the 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 the, the knee jerk reaction is either oh well <laughs> I've been through far worse than that yeah. yes and yeah. uh, or if somebody's like like you if I meet somebody who actually has had a um, a, a good life and a, a, um, a solid sense of self what I get is oh that's just you know no, just brush that off mm. so it's either it's either a minimization because they don't understand or it's a it's a minimization because they think they've had it worse instead of instead of what you try to do in the book uh, to validate those feelings and to find ways to actually uh, understand that they're worthwhile. Like, I'm, I'm just, I'm actually really um, excited by the idea that, that you can be somebody who hasn't experienced it, but that has the compassion to reach out and say, I, I had this good experience and I'd like to bring it to you. Yes, thank you. And I'm glad I'm glad that you really got the validating and the compassionate tone of the book because that's always my intention. This is my third book and whenever I approach a book as a therapist, my goal is to depathologize what we as human beings to varying degrees all grapple with and struggle with and to really normalize for people that whatever their issues are, their struggles, their symptoms, it actually makes sense given where they've come from and what they've experienced in their lives. So I do have very specific intentions around normalizing and depathologizing and hopefully modeling a voice that is really compassionate, non-judgmental, and, and not critical because I think one of the best ways that people can heal from trauma is to be able to approach their life experiences from this place of real compassion and to let go of the criticism, the self-blame, the guilt, the shame. You know, those are sort of the key emotions that so many trauma survivors can spend a lifetime holding on to. And I think when you live your life from a place of shame, it really profoundly impacts your thoughts, your feelings, and all of the subsequent behavioral choices that you make in your life. So part of my mission really is to help people be able to move away from shame. And I think the antidote to shame is self-compassion and curiosity. So those are the things that I really try to bring into my work as a therapist and also into my writing. I've, I've always believed that about uh, curiosity because my saving grace has always been, uh, oh, I'm feeling this or this has happened to me and I want to actually learn more about it. And it just, it takes yeah. away the fear factor in a, in a grid, really large way. It, if, you're, if you're curious, even things that are terrible can be interesting. Yes. <laughs> I no, guess no, that's... good for you. I mean, obviously you have incredible inner wisdom because <laughs> that, you know, that's the perfect way to approach it. You know, whatever it is that's going on for us, uh, no matter how confusing or potentially frightening it is, when we can hold that curiosity about it, you know, what happens with curiosity is we can't be judgmental if we're curious, you know, by definition, when we're curious, we're open-minded. Right. And, um, and you also allude to, uh, an, believe it or not, another chapter in the book, which is be afraid and do it anyway. So, uh, um, I didn't I, get to that one. Yeah, yeah. So I believe really strongly that be afraid. You know, when we're afraid of something, that never has to be synonymous with therefore I can't. So one of the messages of the, that I try to impart in the book is this idea that you know fear is usually well, it's always what you it's what you feel. So you can't say don't don't be afraid. When you're afraid, you're afraid. Um, so to me, it's not an issue of is it legitimate or not legitimate. If you feel it, it's legitimate. But I think the difference is to recognize that you don't have to be held hostage by fear. It doesn't have to create like a roadblock in your life. You can be afraid. You can bring comfort and reassurance to that fear, and you can still do it anyway. And that's how I think we continue to grow. I, I bet you guys wouldn't have accomplished what you've accomplished in your life if when you were afraid, it stopped you in your tracks. Absolutely not. Yeah. You? No, no yeah. comment. 
No comment. <laughs> well, but wait, I, look, you're doing that. You're you're doing something really important here, and I have to believe that when you first thought about it, Hugh, or you first started to do it, there had to be some degree of fear, and yet, you know, here you are doing it. So I do think that you both illustrate the idea that you know we're afraid, and we can still accomplish great things in our lives. He's looking afraid right now. I'm not exactly sure. What, where? <laughs> I'm just. It's looking that way, though. He's, oh, yes, right. No, listen, uh -oh. I want to ask you, uh, kind of just ask another question here, because you're also the uh, the founder uh, of the, the Ferentz Institute. And yes. you're, you're, you're trained, you're, you know, you're providing education and training to mental health professionals. Now, we're, uh, I'm just, you know, following the synchronicity here, because we've got another interview coming up uh, after this one. And in Ontario, anyway, Mm -hmm. in, in in this part of Canada, we are uh, the go the provincial government is uh, uh, trying to put some legislation through that's going to um, make it difficult for alternative practitioners, people that mm -hmm. uh, you know, like uh, people who aren't licensed psychiatrists and psychologists, to uh, practice uh, any kind of counseling. Right? Wow, I was not that's aware ridiculous. of that. And I'm, so, hmm. so I'm, I'm just asking you, and that, that's coming up right after this interview, but so when you're counseling uh, or providing training to the mental health professionals, what is the range of practitioners that you're, uh, that you're working with? It's a great question. I'm proud to tell you it's quite diverse. We have a lot of art therapists. I have movement therapists. Uh, I have uh, licensed certified counselors. I have pastoral counselors, social workers, psychologists. So it, it really does encompass, I think, a broad range of mental health providers. And I can tell you, at least in the lower states, the idea of bringing in right brain-based expressive modalities has really sort of caught on here. And uh, those of us particularly who work with trauma are crystal clear that we have to be uh, bringing in and supporting those adjunctive therapies, whether it's art therapy, Santre, or encouraging people to get massage or acupuncture. You know, I've seen incredible results when people can approach their pain from a more holistic perspective. So are, are you suggesting then that people who do more um, ex expressive modalities are not going to be able to provide psychotherapy? Yeah, that's what's happening. In wow. Ontario. That's and a I big want, deal. What's that? It's, yeah, it that's, is. It is. That's, that's a big deal. Well, and it, it's problematic. Yeah, if you want to tune in right after we finish with you, uh, we, yeah. you you'll, we're going to talk about what's happening in Ontario, and uh, then you'll get a better maybe sense of it but I mean because you're mentioning you're using the word depathologize uh, patholo pathologizing yeah Deep pathologizing <laughs> I guess meant what we call mental we'll just call it problems <laughs> or okay. issues instead of disease right but on the other hand uh, you know the DSM gets thicker every year right yes it does and, yeah. and usually more problematic I would say too. I mean and to, to me that's so uh, I mean, I hear what you're saying that uh, these alternative therapies are gaining um, respect uh, south of the border there. But on the other hand, we see the DSM getting bigger. So yeah. what that's doing, that is, is pathologizing more and more stuff. And it seems to me that, uh, I mean, I, I saw some article where the whole uh, practice uh, of psychiatry is now almost uh, like it's, it's, some people are saying that it's actually disappearing because more and more um, psychiatrists are are looking at it as simply a chemical problem and looking at mm. the only uh, solution as pres prescription drugs of some kind. Any comments? You know, about that? yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're not wrong. First of all, I think that you're right. The DSM gets bigger every year. I've always said that trauma survivors have their own DSM. It's way smaller, but there's se about seven really key diagnoses that they live by, and that's. Weird, abnormal, dirty, broken, crazy, bad, damaged. That's like their DSM. Um, I think there's an interesting phenomenon actually happening in the States that you just made me think of, and that's more and more of my colleagues are not taking insurance anymore. And I wonder, and what that does, by the way, although it can make it you know more onerous for the client, what it does for the, for the clinician is it frees us up to not have to give DSM diagnoses. Uh, and to uh, and be able to look at the client from this more strengths-based depathologized lens. So 
I can't tell you this, you know, based on any research, but it, it is interesting to consider the possibility that perhaps part of why more clinicians are moving away from taking insurance is because they don't want to get caught up in having to pigeonhole and label their clients, you know, using DSM uh, coding and diagnoses. The one thing I'll tell you that I think is positive about DSM-5, and there is to me almost nothing positive about it, but if you look at the new diagnostic criteria for PTSD, for post-traumatic stress disorder, they've actually done a better job of beginning to identify the criteria that is more relevant to what we see in terms of people who are sexually abused or physically abused or living with domestic violence. They've finally taken into consideration the idea that witnessing trauma can be just as traumatizing as experiencing it firsthand. They're paying more attention to the impact that trauma has on very young children, and they're also paying attention to the impact that trauma has when you're a first responder and the vicarious traumatization that can lead to PTSD. So I will tell you, uh, because I'm very tuned into that particular diagnosis, obviously, that I think there has been some positive reworking of the diagnostic criteria. Almost everything else you can sort of throw out the window. <laughs> That's great, though, That's um, um, because it always seems to me that, that um, the only – PTSD that really gets talked about is is military PS, PTSD that we right, that we right. really uh, and I know that in Canada we even had some trouble trouble with um, with support animals um, yeah with yeah. Uh, with uh, uh, trained dogs only being given to actual veterans and if you were a survivor of domestic abuse or sexual childhood sexual abuse or something there was no way in, in hell that you were going to be able to get um, a dog even yeah. if it was even if what you were suffering was worse than um, it just wasn't triage that way. It was always military first and, and everybody else afterwards. And it, it was almost like it wasn't recognized that PTSD could be something that a civilian experienced. That's right. I'll t Jen, you're not wrong. I'll tell you, though, because I do so much traveling because I train all over the world. I'm in airports a lot and on airplanes a lot. I'm actually seeing more and more now civilians with service dogs. Um, and, I, and, I, and I'm always really glad when I see that because I think that it speaks to what you just brought up, that slowly there is more awareness that civilians can suffer pro profound PTSD. And, and I actually think that what service animals can do is nothing short of miraculous. They're, they're just they, – they are regrounding for trauma survivors. They, they have this extraordinary intuition about when the victim gets triggered and they right. actually know how to instantly kind of bring comfort and reground to the victim, which I think is amazing. And I think they just fundamentally help victims feel empowered and safer in the world. So I'm a very big advocate about well, using Talk about having animals. someone supporting you. Like that's, that's a really profound way that somebody could be supporting you. Um, yeah. in the way you were talking about earlier. It, it strikes me, too, that um, something we were talking about earlier, um, there's a lot of people who have early trauma who have never experienced what it's like to be, uh, to have a, a healthy environment. Um, yes. And I think a lot of times we're thinking that people should somehow return to a, peer, uh, to a, a level of health after they've been traumatized that they never have experienced. They've, they have no modeling for that. Your exi Sorry, I, I just my phone went off, and oh. I wanted to make sure that you guys. Didn't oh no, hear we're it. still okay. Seamless. You can even take that call if you want. Me, so. <laughs> <laughs> as long as they don't mind being on the air, we're, we're totally fine with that. Uh, I'm sorry. So you were alluding to people who have experienced very young trauma, right? And then, and then, do you mind repeating what you said about or, or, that? Or, for example, somebody who um, who became traumatized in childhood, um, they've never had an experience of being a healthy adult. So if you yeah. kind of assume that they can go back to being a healthy person, they're really going into uncharted territory. They're not returning to something. They're creating a whole new way of being. And I think that um, that was one of the reasons um, I went through some uh, CBT therapy. And mm -hmm. it seems to be predicated on the notion that there's a normal that you used to be that mm -hmm. you can get back to. But I think with trauma survivors, often there is no normal that there was. It's, it's yeah. something that you've never been. Normal is traumatized. Sure, a hundred percent. And in fact, it's so normalized that when you get the opportunity, for example, to be in a relationship that's loving and safe, it can actually feel quite dissonant and quite foreign. And I've worked with many people over the years, you know, very poignantly who have sabotaged unintentionally, but have sabotaged loving, safe relationships because where's the drama? Where's the crisis? You know, where's the, where's the lack of respect? It, they almost don't know how to initially navigate things that are loving and 
and safe and validating because it's so alien to what for them has become a normal way of life. Right. So how do you actually deal with that? Is it a, is it a like um is it something that you deal with specifically or is it the yeah. modeling yeah. or yeah, it's very much modeling. This is where I think we get into what I think is the extraordinary power of the therapeutic relationship. Um, you know, what people need to, I think, to fundamentally feel safe in the world, have a core sense of worth, and be able to navigate the vicissitudes of life is a secure attachment. I think that's the foundation that everything then is, is, is built up from. And we know that for children who are growing up in families where there's addiction or there's undiagnosed, untreated depression or anxiety or other forms of dysfunction or trauma or abuse or neglect, they're not getting secure attachment. So from the get-go, it's like they're untethered in the world in many ways. When people find the courage to come into therapy, the therapeutic relationship is often their very first experience with secure attachment. And although there's a lot of testing that initially, you know, I think takes <laughs> normally takes place in that relationship, when the, the, the client can really start to believe and trust that this therapist is going to stay non-judgmental and this is an unconditional relationship and I am going to get the validation and the support that I need and this person is not going to give up on me. They're going to hang in there with me. That is the reparative experience of secure attachment. And so as that is modeled and, and experienced in therapy, it slowly begins to translate into other relationships. We're literally helping our clients resolve trust versus mistrust, which is something that we were all supposed to be able to resolve from zero to two years old. But we have to have loving, consistent, predictable, secure attachment caretakers to resolve trust versus mistrust. Right. Then, yeah, that just seems like, it seems so obvious. obvious. I mean, it does seem very obvious. Um, and I think that a lot of people who have secure attachments um, can build on that. And of course, they may go farther quicker than somebody who doesn't have those secure attachments. And it's, it's a real, it's crippling to not have the ability to, to feel secure so that you feel yeah. like you can go out and, and make brave choices. That's um, right, that's right. Now, uh, just, uh, I mean, it's, it's always interesting to me the difference between the Canadian and the American medical systems, uh, because despite the fact we have a socialized me Medicare system here, we have, we have a, a amazing health coverage in Canada. Everything's free. <laughs> well, every, everything wow. is free to a point, <laughs> wow. but, um, but I, I mean, I, I know that it's, despite the fact that psychiatrists are free, uh, that the psychiatrists are covered, psychologists is, are, aren't. Yeah, and um, none of those alternative practitioners And none of the alternative practitioners either. are. Yeah, that's right. So um, one of the big things that stands in the way of, of, I think, everyone who's trying to get mental health is, is it's very dependent on your income. Yeah, well, listen, that's why I write the books that I write for exactly that reason, because I'm very sensitive to the reality that millions of people either don't have access to mental health resources or cannot afford mental health resources or, believe it or not, still, still feel stigmatized about seeking out mental right. health resources. And so I write the books that I write so that people can take their own private personal journeys, particularly those who don't have access to health care. And as I said, the journaling prompts in the book really allow people to go deeper, to gain new insights. And there's also strategies like, you know, concrete strategies for growth and change because so many people do have to take that journey by themselves. That's great. Um, what are your other, your other two books? Uh, I don't think I actually read the titles. What, what are your first two yeah. books about? So, so um, they're related to treating self-destructive behaviors in trauma survivors because uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's such an overlap, as you can imagine, between people who don't get good attachment, who therefore don't learn how to, in healthy ways, regulate their emotional states, and as they grow up, need ways to cope. And so they become very vulnerable to turning to eating disorders and addictions and and acts of self-mutilation on the body. And so uh, I wrote the first book for clinicians, again, this very strength-based, depathologized approach to treating self-destructive behaviors in trauma survivors. And then two years later, I, I wrote a workbook called um, Letting Go of Self-Destructive Behaviors, a workbook of hope and healing, again, for people who don't necessarily have access to mental health support, but who are struggling mightily with addictions and eating disorders and, and acts of, of self-mutilation. 
The books move them away from shame, bring in the self-compassion, and also give them very concrete ways to self-soothe and regulate so they don't have to keep turning to something destructive, which works in the short term and then inevitably leaves people in, a, in, a, in an even deeper place of shame. So, Lisa, what you're saying really is that somebody who's, uh, you know, can, who's diagnosing themselves, they they just want to get over some of the issues that they're dealing with. They could actually get your book, and um, and uh, it, you know, if they're they could theoretically, potentially work through their problems just reading the book, following some of the advice in it. That yes. Yes. Accurate. I mean, look, I'm all about therapy. I think therapy is a gift that everybody deserves to have. And I do talk in the books about, you know, if you can do it, find the courage and do it because everybody deserves a cheerleader and everybody deserves to have that unconditional support that's quite unique to the therapeutic relationship. But yes, Hugh, I've gotten a lot of feedback in the last few years from people who have just used the workbook and are now using the new book, Finding Your Ruby Slippers. And they say, I, I can't believe how much insight I'm gaining. I can't believe how much, uh, I how I'm able to talk to myself in ways that are kinder. And I have sort of have your voice in my head now, you know, being a cheerleader for me, which I'm thrilled about. And I understand a little bit more what compassion means and what it sounds like and what it looks like. So yeah, people can can make tremendous progress. The thing that really struck me about the book is that is that it does not kind of go to that catchphrase, um, happy, um, everything's going to be okay place that a lot of self-help <laughs> books do. It, it, it doesn't seem to try to build up a brand for you. What it mm -hmm. does is it breaks things right down to their most basic. This is what people think. This is what people feel. This is yeah. this might be what you're feeling. Um, these are the things that human beings need. And to me, that speaks to a great understanding of the the base needs of humanity that go beyond the the uh the external ways that we try to tart up our experiences all right jen you are my new pr person <laughs> you, you just you just brilliantly and eloquently like really summarized it you know wonderfully you you got it and, and thank you because again that certainly was the intention when I wrote the book. Um, it's not about sugarcoating what people struggle with. And in fact, post-traumatic growth, which is something I talk a lot about and we'll talk about in my next book, um, it, it's, it's growth through struggle. So it's not in any way saying, let's minimize, as you said in the beginning, let's not minimize the pain that you're in. Let's never invalidate the pain you're in. You know, your pain is real and it makes sense that you have it. And here's ways to begin to process it and to bring comfort to it, because I think that's hugely important. Uh, and, and in that process, you will begin to heal from it. But you're right. It's not about pretending everything is great because it's not. Millions and millions of people suffer, you know, emotionally, psychologically, somatically on their bodies, cognitively and mentally. Um, there's a lot of unmetabolized trauma out there in the world. And so it is important that somebody who picks that book up and has had those experiences doesn't feel like what's happening, what has happened is being minimized. But the book, I want to be clear that Ruby Slippers is not just for people who have been traumatized. It's really for anyone who has the curiosity about continuing to self-actualize and continuing to grow and move forward in their lives. Well, that's what we all want to do. But I hope we haven't traumatized Andrea by suggesting that Jen become the new PR person. <laughs> no, no, I'm, no I'm sorry. No, I'm Did saying? I take somebody's job. No, no, just tell, <laughs> tell her she can steal anything I said as a quote and put it as an endorsement. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm totally good with that. Yes, <laughs> Thank absolutely. You. So um, now uh, uh, – we're getting near the end here, Lisa. Now, there, you know, there's been a lot of self-help books uh, through the years. A lot of people um, dealing, uh, trying to deal with or help people to deal with these kind of issues. What would you say is uh, special, unique, new about mm -hmm. this book that's going to help? You know, that, you know? I, I, again, believe it or not, I think it, part of it is what Jen just eloquently said. It, it's, um, it, it's not a book that says, let's pretend everything is great when everything is not great. So it, the intention is to normalize. The intention is to validate. I'm very, one of the sort of through lines of the book is continually asking the reader to notice how they talk to themselves about themselves. I actually think it's one of the single most important things because it informs everything we do. The way that we talk to ourselves about ourselves impacts our, our emotions, our subsequent thoughts and our behavioral choices. So 
So I think what's unique about this book is this ongoing, gentle, kind reminder um, to keep looking at how do you talk to yourself about this issue. And there's many issues that get covered in the book, whether it's whether or not this is a you're in a safe relationship, whether or not you feel fulfilled in the workplace or you're in a toxic workplace, how to overcome obstacles in your life, how to be more in the present moment, how you can continue to grow and change. And so as we look at those like 35 different potential issues, every one of them is within the context of keep noticing how you think about this stuff, how you talk to yourself about this stuff, and then see if you can begin to shift how you think and talk to yourself, particularly if it's critical and it's not and you're not approaching it with compassion and kindness so i think that's the uniqueness of my journal prompts because they're very intentionally meant to keep bringing people back to this place of kindness and self-compassion and i and i think that's super important and i love the ruby sniffer i i I really do love the ruby slivers analogy (laughs) yeah good Well, I got to go. I got to go to the uh, the Wizard of Oz Museum. I was da- we were down in Oklahoma. Oh wow! I made I made my my boyfriend at the time drive into the middle of Kansas so I could go to the museum. I didn't even know that existed. That's really it has cool. to though, doesn't it? Did you see the ruby slippers? I saw the ruby slippers. I, I don't know if they yeah. were the. I think the ruby the ruby slippers are in are in the Smithsonian or something. Yes. But yeah, yeah, I think that's I saw, right. I saw yeah. a pair of ruby slippers. Yeah, yeah. It's such a great <laughs> metaphor, though, isn't it? You know that. Oh yeah. Everything- Everything we need is, you know, is really within us. I, I love the idea of promoting that. Okay, Lisa, it's been great to have you on. Uh, and here's the book again, The Ruby Slippers, Finding Your Ruby Slippers. And uh, now people can go to your website, lisaferentz.com. But where, where can they get the book, Lisa? So they can get all my books on Amazon or they can get all of my books through the website. So either place will will get them what they need. And I do encourage people to go to the website. They can either get there through lisaferentz.com or theferentzinstitute.com because there's a lot of free resources there for people. Um, There's other stuff I've written and there's my radio show and other stuff that people can access for free so that they can continue to learn how to uh, self-actualize and grow and heal. Okay, fantastic. That's what we're going to do. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, Thank you. We're going to take a little break here on Liquid Lunch, and we're going to come back and talk with uh, Dee Nicholson about what's happening uh, for alternative uh, psychotherapy practitioners in Ontario. So I don't know, Lisa, if you want to stay tuned for that, tell you what we're dealing with up here, because people are uh, concerned about it. It's uh, problematic. It's a major shift. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to take a little break. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, guys. You made it really fun. Okay, great. (laughs) Great. Okay, we're going to keep the fun going even though we're talking about serious topics here on thatchannel.com. We'll be right back.